Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. All right, let's get going. What is up, successful dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have my very own sister, actually, Shalan Ginger. So, uh, Shalan at 20 years old, is a serial entrepreneur focusing her ventures on inspiring and empowering others to chase their dreams and goals in life. Two weeks before graduating with her AA in college, Shalan opened New You Juice Bar along with three other partners at the age of 18. Under a year later, she launched the Entrepreneur Before 25 podcast out of a desire to inspire and unite young and like-minded entrepreneurs together. On the podcast, Shalan interviews inspiring entrepreneurs who have started their journey at the age of 25 and under. So, sister. Yes. That's the intro I have for you, but <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, Kylan, first of all, thanks for having me on the Successful Dropout Podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been a, been a long time coming. Yeah, it has been. We actually did an interview swap, so yep. fair trade. She just interme- interviewed me on her podcast, so if if you want to hear that, go to eb25, entrepreneurbefore25.com. There, that was it. <laughs> yeah, but a little bit more about me. I mean, that bio pretty much says it all. I'm currently 20. I own the Juice Bar, um, New Year Juice Bar, and that is going phenomenal. We're just about to celebrate our two-year anniversary in June. I am so That's excited crazy. because, you know, when we opened it, in market research, we realized that no juice bar had really been successful in Yakima for longer than two years. So once we hit this mark, it's gonna be, it's gonna be big. It's gonna be huge. Um, anyway, <laughs> and along with that, I also host the Entrepreneur Before Twenty Five podcast, which is one of my favorite outlets where I get to um, conduct inspiring interviews with tons of young entrepreneurs every week and it's a great platform to meet new people and to talk to cool people like yourself yeah it's a great podcast you guys should definitely go check it out it sounds a lot better than mine i think (laughs) really i was thinking the same about yours no well i think you care a little bit more about maybe your audio quality than oh that would be true I feel like as a general rule, I try a lot harder, but you might get better results, which it's just an unfair world sometimes. <laughs> well, okay, so you have your associate's degree, correct? Yes. So what are you doing on Absolutely the show Absolutely nothing with that associate's degree. <laughs> what am I doing on the successful dropout show? That's, yeah, I mean, tec- are you a dropout, actually, technically? You know, we were talking about this before, and I consider myself a dropout because I'm a very goal-oriented person. So for six years, six years, every single educational goal I had was to graduate with my degree in dietetics. And to do that, I had to get my associates. And so it was my full intention until you came along and ruined my plans. Literally, actually, (laughs) I think it was you. (laughs) Um, To graduate as a dietitian, uh, I think it would be in like two years now. 
Um, and so I did Running Start, which is where you enroll in college as a junior in high school. So I was 16 when I started high school, and I was homeschooled up until then. So it was a pretty drastic change. Jeez. And then graduated with my, my two-year degree, that one sp- like piece of paper I needed to get into the school I wanted to go to um, at the age of 18. But... You know, and the plan was to always go straight into dietetic school. But in my second year of college, um, about halfway through, I was praying for an opportunity, you know, and a way to make money doing something I love, preferably my own thing, my own business. And a week later, uh, you and your business partner, Landon, came up to me and you're like, yo, Shalane, you want to help us run a juice bar in Just the... Like that. Yeah, I, I was go. <laughs> that was gangster. actually probably exactly how that conversation. It was probably via text. No, you pulled me aside at the end of a business class. You both pulled me aside, and I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> oh, oh, <yeah. laughs> so you're like, hey, "What's up, Shalant?" <laughs> <laughs> yo, you want to run a business with Sad us? Sad <laughs> dude. So, no, you said you want to help us run a juice bar. And my famous line that I That's quote true. in like every interview I ever do is, you know me, I'm a ginger. I would need some ownership. And I'm pretty sure that's verbatim what I said. So That's what we expected, too. Yeah, you knew it. You just tried to, tried to get we that We tried to there. see if we could get you without yeah. any uh, equity, but... Uh. So, uh, nope, I'm smarter than that. Thank God. So a week later, you know, we met, and seven months later, through about three times where it just wasn't going to happen, we opened the juice bar. And, you know, I I told my parents and everything, okay, so I'm graduating like two weeks after we open this. I'm going to run it and make it completely self-running during the summer and enroll in college again (laughs) in September. Well, over the summer, a lifetime of experiences, I got to September and I was like, I don't know if I still want to do college. I don't know if I'm really passionate about dietetics anymore. And so, you know... And I was, I did actually try to register and everything. So with all that being said, I feel like I qualify to be here today. I, I think you do too. I mean, Thank well, you. you know, let's see. How, how did the conversation with mom and dad go? Because I think that's also what determines, you know, a college dropout is how, uh, how crazy that conversation is. Well, mom and dad are great. So I don't know if this is going to qualify. Did they give either. you any pushback at all? Okay. Well, here's the thing. I feel like the biggest pushback I got was for myself because I am so goal oriented. So I had worked Mm. towards this for so long. And, you know, I was doing dietetics because my first business was at 15 and it was a health coaching business. And it was my full intention to always go back into that. But I needed a a degree, right, to back me up. Right. And um, so I was fully intending to go through it. And I was actually Oren, my brother-in-law, who triggered I think we all have those moments where somebody says just like one sentence and it just completely shifts your perspective he was like so are you actually like passionate about health coaching anymore Shlan? and I was like oh my gosh no I am not and he's like so what degree do you think would really help you and I was like oh my word nothing I don't know <laughs> right and so that's when that kind of started to transition in my mind and um I I realized the importance right then and there of going to mom and dad with a plan um, when I presented it to them and the idea of me potentially not going back to college. So I spent a lot of time, you know, praying and thinking and really like deciding and putting together a plan and mainly the reasons why I shouldn't go and why it would just be a waste of time, money, energy, all of the above to go. And um then I talked to dad first, I believe, and it was one of those casual late night conversations. I come home or sitting after dinner and I'm like, you know, dad, I, I'm actually thinking about taking a break from college. He chokes on his food. He's like, oh, what? <laughs> what? Everyone Spits goes to college. <laughs> Don't be about your brother. <laughs> Don't be. You hadn't even started successful dropout yet, so... This it was is on true. the DL. So you can't really say that, well, I guess I kind of did influence you maybe a bit. You dropped out. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely dropped out. Um, but no, when I presented it logically to dad, I was like, look, I don't really want to do health coaching. I'm really loving the juice bar and just the whole concept of entrepreneurship. He totally got it. And then a few days later, I think I talked to mom. And, you know, at first she was kind of like, oh, you know, like... Well, I don't know. And then I kind of presented things and we were going to 
So, so I presented it to her and we talked about it. And then we drove together to business class. And by the end of that drive, she was the one I felt brilliant. She was the one who's like, you know, you're right. I don't think that college really is the best option for you right now. <laughs> and I kind of played it off at the time. Like, I'm just not going to go back right now because mm-hmm. just not right now. And now it's like, right, never. Right, right. <laughs> and which is one of the tactics that we've talked about here on yeah. the show previously is that one one of those things. And I say tactic like you're trying to pull one over on them, but that's <laughs> not the case. I mean, it's always smart. But you say here for a set period of time. I'm going to go, I'm going to try this new venture, pursue this idea or this dream job, whatever, you know, takes you away from college. And if it doesn't work out, then I agree to come back and pick up classes. If it does, we're going to sit down and reevaluate. And sounds like that's what you did, huh? Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's important to, when you're presenting it to your family members and stuff, to have the right motive and to not just be dropping out because it was hard, which is obviously not what I did. I graduated with my Mm -hmm. associates and I wasn't scared of the workload. And you were how old at that time? 18. So, so you would have finished your degree. How, at what age? I think 22, 22. Yeah. 22. And so I didn't drop, I didn't not go back, um, because it was hard. It was, or because I was scared. It was literally because there was no purpose to it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so that was my motive. Um, and I feel like a lot of college dropouts get a bad rap because, you know, they drop out when they're about to fail a class or they drop out because they just don't have the energy or want the workload. Right. But so drop out for the right reasons, put together a plan and, you know, a path to success and then present it. Don't go to your parents and be like, hey, so I hate college. And I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you bring that up because that's one of the things I, I try to preach here on the show. What, what, what I don't like to see is people dropping out because they're they're failing out, or maybe school's just boring, right? And they're just looking for an alternative, just something. I just want something different. You know, dropping out is 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 a lot tougher. That's that's the challenge. Staying in school is is the easy part. You drop out oh, yeah. if if you know like you there's truly no purpose in it and what's what you feel called to do does not, you know, require college and if you're seeing a path there and then ideally you'd start working on that idea or that business like like you did before you drop out. Maybe you right. you start generating revenue. Um and then besides that, you know, just make sure and and drop out for for the right reasons. Mhm. Oh, yeah, for sure. So you decided to drop out. And now, so what happened after that then? And where, where are we today with the with the juice bar and everything? Yeah, so keep in mind, I graduated. So it's kind of confusing, but I graduated high school three days before we opened the juice bar. And I graduated college two weeks after we opened it. So That's really confusing. <laughs> I was in finals the first two weeks of the juice bar, which was awesome awful don't recommend that um and then you know we had it up and running through the summer and when september hit was when i was thinking about enrolling again and about the time when i decided not to or i think i decided to put it on hold and like in april of the following year i was like nope definitely not going back (laughs) it was it was like the thing that was always on my to-do list like research colleges call colleges (laughs) enroll in colleges and just never got done um and man, since then, it has been the most impactful, packed of learning two years of my entire life. Like, I just don't think that you can gain as much experience and knowledge and wisdom in a college setting classroom of like getting your business degree than you can of actually being out in starting a business. Because mm-hmm. you're right, Kylan, being in college is actually the easy route because I don't care what your excuse is. You can always figure out how to get an A on a test, like study for the test, right? Mm -hmm, But if you're running a business, there is no set path to success. You kind of just have to to wing it and do your do your very best. And you might not by doing. Yeah, yeah, you might not get an A. You'll probably get a negative in the bank account for a little bit potentially. (laughs) Um, But now the juice bar is absolutely thriving it's been amazing to see like the growth in it and you know the culture we've created and the customers that we have and how we've been able to educate the people of Yakima when it comes down to health because Yakima is five to ten years behind everyone else health-wise which is no joke 
100% truth. Um, when we opened the juice bar, it was just like a foreign concept. People were like, so, you know, do you go to like Costco and you buy like apple juice and serve it? And I was like, what do you think we are? Well, Yakima, it was just a couple of years ago, Yakima was labeled as one of the most obese cities in the U.S. Yeah. Per, per capita, of yep. course. But, uh, yeah, it's not really known for its health. And to date, this is, well, today, still, the it's the only juice bar in, in, Yakima. in town. Yep. <laughs> there was a, there was a... Uh, it was called Piccadilly's, and my business partner and I, um, it was a juice cafe. We went there 1 p.m. on a Monday. We walk in there, and... If you're an employee, never say this. She was like, oh my word, you're my first customers for today. <laughs> and my business partner and I just look at each other with that look of, are we sure we want to start a juice I bar? Yeah. Um, but they went out of business like three months and after And I was going to say started. Jamba Juice too, probably three years prior to that, had had come and gone in the space right. of, of a few years as well. So it was a yeah, big, was, which the juice bar is attached to the yoga studio uh, that we also own. It's all in the same building. So I don't know if we would have built it if it wasn't attached to the yoga studio. It's a similar business, and we thought there'd be a lot of cross-traffic. But actually, which there actually isn't. There's not as much. They yeah. stand completely on their own two feet, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. So for for you people listening, uh, Shalan has has just done a fantastic job. So at at you know 19 years old, she's she had employees to manage and and be in charge of and a business to run um because i we'll get into the story i guess of how you started taking most you know everything over but right (laughs) now as we speak um she's got the whole place running almost flawlessly on systems and she's got just there's a system for everything even on how to handle the, the knives in there and it makes everything run super smoothly the the customer service is just off off the charts and very consistent. Um, and the culture there, the the other gals that work there, is just phenomenal. And you guys even developed a a culture book, which was taken from mm-hmm. is that Tony Tony Shea? Yeah, from Delivering Happiness Group. Delivering book. Happiness, and he's the founder of uh, Zappos. It? Zappos, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was a concept from his book, and what they did is created uh, a new you culture book where all the employees, you know, past and present. Uh, wrote down what they view the new new you culture as you know they they put the new you culture as they understood it and felt it into words and it's mm-hmm. in this book and so now future employees you know read that and it just it perpetuates and customers uh, yeah 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 oh yeah and we you know the customers see that too and stuff so um but yeah so earlier i was talking about how you slowly <laughs> started taking over most of that so what what's the the story there how did that happen so landon and i we built the studio mm-hmm. we approached you and said we, we basically want you to help us run this mm-hmm. and then you take it from there yeah and then um i think sean landon's brother uh was also uh brought in a week later so all i knew is show up at at this the juice bar space a week later and then sean was there and you know sean and I were both 18, both in college, both had no idea what we were doing. I honestly, guys, hadn't even juiced before myself. I went home that night and juiced, and I was like, oh, my word, this takes so much work. (laughs) There were so many, do we really want to do this moments? Um, And then, you know, through seven months of, you know, trying to find – The investors, gathering equipments, making systems, Uh, we opened our doors, and Mm -hmm. the first day was precious, Um, and we thought it would be a great idea to try to have Sean and I actually run it for the first two months by ourselves, but that didn't work, and so (laughs) we just had a few friends, and we were like, hey, hop in here, and I will (laughs) never do that again. Um, it, It worked out, but... It was just, there was no systems, there was no interview, um, and it it was just very chaotic. (laughs) It was like one of those things where I'm a very planned out person, and so I tried to put all these plans into place, and then when you actually experienced it, I mean, the first five months was just remaking system after system. But anyway, to make matters, let's not say worse, but a lot more fun, um, (laughs) for a graduation present, my, my dad and... Uh, brother-in-law had offered to take my sister and I on a trip uh, tour around Europe and of course wasn't going to say no to that so I think I left for that like 
um, let less than a month after we'd open. Yeah. And then Sean was gone a lot that summer. Kylan and Landon were gone a lot that summer. So we opened end of May. It was our soft opening. And it wasn't until October that we were all like in the same place at the same time running this business together. And that's when it became very apparent. It just was not going to really work out. Um, you know, Sean was really there for the like the experience of a startup right just like getting the experience of starting up a business and I was you know there for the long haul I really wanted to see it succeed I really wanted to see um you know the people of Yakima be impacted for health and Kylan and Landon originally were were there because they came up with the concept they helped raise the the money helped build out the space um and so what kind of started happening is I ended up doing a lot of the stuff and we all kind of saw that and um, we're all super good friends and grew up together. Right. So we had one meeting and then that one meeting basically decided to restructure the entire ownership um because it was split between four people, 25% each. We decided in that one meeting to basically restructure everything and bring Kylan and Landon's wives on, Tay and Kennedy, um, in place of basically all you guys. And then I didn't even ask for it, but you guys were like, okay, well, logically, Shalane should get 50%. And I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) sure. And the business was worth absolutely nothing. And you'd think that in a conversation like that, there'd be some hard feelings, there'd be some, you know, maybe some anger, I don't know, some frustration. But at the end of that conversation, we were all like laughing, hugging. You know, we went over right then and there and signed over the LLC. And um, so in October, pretty much everything changed. And then I had 50% all of a sudden of this business. And I think it was you, Kyle, that had to have a talk with me a few months after that because I was totally not owning that, um, not acting like majority owner because it happened so fast. I didn't even ask for it. And then I realized, oh, the majority of this business is actually completely on my shoulders and I need to be the one to call this and that and, you know, take ownership of this. So that's kind of how it all went down. (laughs) Fun story. <laughs> yeah, so it got off to a bit of a, a rough start, but yeah. in the end, everybody uh, found their spot and found where, where they were all happy, and um, Shalane's just kind of taken off with the place. Okay, so you are uh, the juice master extraordinaire, <laughs> the <laughs> and uh, sure. <laughs> and actually, you know, to to make a long story short, the juice bar is profitable, and you're working there a lot and making a a full-time salary uh, with that and, of course, learning learning a lot still. Oh, yeah, um, never stop. So now you have the podcast as well. So talk a little bit about that, how you came up with that idea and what that's all about. Yeah, well, as you can imagine, at 18 years old, when you go straight from being a college student to a business owner, that's quite the life transition there. And so I guess you could say I lost the ability to relate to a lot of my original friend group. It's not even that the friendships ended. It's more like they just dissolved (laughs) because I was, you know, on a completely different wavelength, like bipolar opposite now, you know, their biggest challenge was, oh, you know, I procrastinate for a test and gonna fail it. And I'm like, Okay, so... We just lost two employees. We just lost two employees. Um, Customers are angry. People could die. (laughs) Just escalates from angry customers to death. (laughs) Uh, That's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah, for for real. Um, Anyway, and so I just was beyond frustrated because I had no one to relate to besides my business partners. And to this day, I've still not met a... Um, a person who started a brick and mortar, not social media or online, but a brick and mortar at 18 years old. Still haven't waiting for that day. If you're listening and you're one of them, shoot me an email. I'd love to meet you. (laughs) Um, but we're we're kind of anomalies in that, in that brick and mortars. I don't want to say it's harder, but 
there are specific challenges that you face with the brick and mortar that you just wouldn't. Right. Or like physical service-based companies. I mean, that was yeah. the, the painting company for me, my first company. Whereas most people our age now, they're starting, you know, these online businesses, and so, which, which we're moving into now. But Yeah, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying brick and mortar, it's like a completely different type. It helps you really understand the concept, like how business works, all the ins and outs, though. I feel like almost better than an online business in some ways because everything is ta- everything is tangible, like right. from the ingredients that create your product to your product to, you know, you actually serve the customer, you know, face to face. They're kind handing you their business. money from their wallet or, yeah. or complaining right there in front of you. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I was doing that. And, like, I feel like the first six months were pretty lonely for me. Actually, probably longer than six months because I was just in uh, business. You, you had and me. Kyle and I always have you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so I was super frustrated. And I remember venting to family members and just everyone. Like, I would give anything to talk to a young entrepreneur. Anything. Like, anyone out there. I I literally thought young entrepreneurs did not exist, okay? And I was like, well, they've got to exist somewhere. And if they do exist, then chances are they might be feeling the same way I am. And I was like, all right, well, I'm a ginger. Once again, I'm going to create a solution to my own problem. And Kylan had (laughs) talked about podcasting a lot. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to start a podcast for young entrepreneurs. So, um, that's how the idea came about, and it was kind of born out of a healthy frustration to make a difference, to make a change, to create a community of young entrepreneurs where you could come and listen to a podcast from from people, from inspiring people who are running the same race you are in life and facing the same things. I think there's something so powerful about relating to like-minded people and hearing from people who are in similar situations as you, because it really opens up your perspectives. And um, as humans, we're meant to connect. We're meant to see eye to eye with people. And so came up with the idea probably in April, started really working on it then and opened it or launched it in June. Um and it kind of became a competition with this podcast, actually, Successful Dropout, because we were sitting in Kylan's kitchen one day, and I was like, guys, it's on my goal sheet, which I'm huge on, huge on goals, to find a name this week, to make a name, and pulled out all these awful names. And <laughs> Kylan and Tay were, like, helping me brainstorm, and Kylan was like, Successful Dropout, what have you targeted towards? And he laid out this whole business plan for this podcast, and I was like, no. For my podcast. I really don't like that. <laughs> And then he kind of left for a little bit and Tay and I are still brainstorming and Tay was like, entrepreneur before 25. And I was like, huh, maybe, yes. <laughs> and then Kylan's like, I'm going to start Successful Dropout. And then it was like, oh, it's a race. It's on, brother. Oh, it's on. Literally, brother. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, the podcast has been absolutely like one of the best things that I can imagine. I can't tell you how many amazing entrepreneurs I've been able to have on the show Um, what a great platform it's been for meeting new people and networking to new people. And at the end of the day, it's something I'm super passionate about, creating that community, that like-minded community. And so (laughs) I enjoy it. I enjoy doing the interviews and meeting people. And I know a lot of people who listen to it obviously do as well. But at the end of the day, because the podcast is something I'm passionate about and because the juice bar is something I'm passionate about, um... I love life and it's it's not work for me because I am accomplishing my overall goal in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very apparent from from where I'm sitting too. Um so the question I have is so you talk to a lot of really young entrepreneurs on the show. Right. And I know a lot of people listening are probably in that age range, you know, anywhere from, you know, 16 to 25 years old um and you're maybe in school and thinking about possibly dropping out, maybe starting a business um, or opting out or maybe already have a business. I guess from you, since you have so much experience talking to young entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. what are some of the most common traits among them that, that have made them successful that you can share, you know, with, with people listening? Hmm. That's a hard one because there's so many, you know, I've, I think I was telling you yesterday, I'm 
have like 45 interviews published at the time of this recording and like I've done probably 60 something. So that's yeah. a lot of wisdom right there. Um, but the things I've noticed from young entrepreneurs who are inspiring and successful is they're, they're creators and to be creators, they have committed to being continual learners and being teachable. There's hungry for knowledge and they also are really good at um, goal setting too. No matter what that means for them, goal setting can be anything, but having a goal and then <clears throat> taking action. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds super cliche because everyone has those those memes with their face and then you know an overlay of Texas is just take action. But um, <laughs> there is a lot to be said with that because we can we can plan and we can goal set all day long, but at the end of the day, taking that action and then getting up when you fall down. Um, I think there's a statistic that, you know, you fail at seven businesses before you succeed at one, um, something like that. So, you know, they're teachable. They're very committed to learning. Um, they're hungry for knowledge. They have a goal, a purpose, and a huge why. Like the bigger your why, the bigger your goal is going to be and vice versa. And then they're willing to take take action on that um, and yeah. really just chase that with all their worth. But I think most of all, they're, they're creators and consumers at the same time. And what do you mean by consumers? They're consuming the knowledge they need to create I see, more. I see. When you say consumers, it makes me think of like, you know, retail consumers, shopping, yeah. stuff like that. But no, no, I, I get what you mean. Like they're being co continual learners. I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier about your, your reasons from dropping out. You know, if you're the kind of person where you're thinking of dropping out of college because just it's it's too hard, the tests are boring, you're not able to keep up with the homework and you've got you've got to know yourself. If you're a lazy person, if you know you're lazy, if if all you can wait to do is just just get the minimum done so you can go home and watch binge watch Netflix and mm -hmm. you do that consistently. I mean and I, I still do that from, from, from time to time. <laughs> Sometimes you've seen As I say that, I'm like, oh yeah. But but you know what I mean. Like you have to be introspective and realize, like, are are you kind of a lazy person? And and I don't mean that to be mean or anything. Just you probably shouldn't drop out because you probably need that that system, that structure around you, that pipeline for in somebody telling you, you know, what to do. Like this is what you're supposed to do next. Mm -hmm. This is the next step, and you'll and you'll do that. You know, honestly, all the way through you know, be, being employed somewhere and, you know, uh, working at the, that place. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, people leave incredibly fulfilled and, and happy lives going that route, but you just have to know yourself. If you're going to drop out and leave that system, it's going to be a challenge and you're going to want to, you're going to, you need to want that challenge right? and you need to have the initiative and the drive to, to be a continual learner and to continue to build stuff, take risks, mm -hmm. and because you're going to fail a lot. And uh, to be able to get back up and keep learning from those failures is key. Yeah, and also something that almost every single person that I've interviewed has in common is they're very self-aware and they're very committed to personal growth. And I think we've all experienced this to a big extent that you can't grow something in your life beyond where you personally are. Um, and so they're very committed to doing what it takes to grow, grow themselves. They're very self-aware and they're taking mm -hmm. ownership. Like, oh my word, taking ownership is huge. They're taking ownership of, of where they're at, where their weaknesses are. They find people to work with that really contrast those well. And they're just very committed to personal growth because they understand that you can't grow anything in your life beyond where you personally are. Yeah, you know, a couple of things there. You you mentioned extreme or you mentioned ownership and that yeah. makes me think of extreme ownership. So there's a book called Extreme Ownership I, by... Life-changing book. Is it Jocko Willink? And Leif Babin. And Leif Babin. They're ex-Navy SEALs. And so I would highly suggest reading that book. We'll have it in the show notes. Um, but the concept of that book is just is taking ownership at every single level for everything in your life, even if at, at a at a at a surface level or, or looking at it, it really wasn't your responsibility. Maybe somebody right. else's responsibility that something bad you know happened. There's a way for you to still take ownership of that, and then that comes down to um, 
you know, yourself and being able to be very, um, introspective and, and, uh, uh, have that self discipline. And the other thing I was going to mention is you kind of mentioned the, the people in the community you have around you. I feel like if there's somebody listening right now who you understand all of this stuff, like you understand that, that you need to be self-disciplined and, and driven and, and take initiative in these areas, but it's really, you're finding it really difficult to do that. I would encourage you to take a look at the people you've surrounded yourself with because, it, th- and this is a, a, a cold, hard fact of life. You're the average of the five people you hang around the most. And that includes family as well, to, to be quite honest. And so if you know the kind of person you want to be and for some reason you just feel like there's a barrier there and you're not able to break through, I would take a look at the friends and the people you, you have around you. And if if the case is, is such, maybe you need to get new friends and, and maybe even you need to stop hanging around that uncle, you know, or so, or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, why do you think we're always so hyped up and just ready to take action after we spend a weekend at an entrepreneur conference and mm. then in our everyday lives, you know, with your coworkers or, you know, whatever, your family members, if that's the case, that's unfortunate, but you have to be able to, to be self-aware and realize that, you know, where are you the most self-motivated? Where are you the most action prone and then really fight to get around those people. Yeah. Love it. Uh, so Shalane, tell us, uh, just a quick story about what you would consider to be your worst entrepreneurial moment to date. Every time I get asked this question, I always think of a different one cause there's so many, <laughs> but I think that it's these moments that really define like who you are. I think it's the hardest right. moments we go through as individuals that define who we are because we really realize when rubber hits the road what we're willing to fight for. And, you know, we always say we're willing to go through, or I always say I'm willing to go through hell and back to live the life that I'm supposed to live with the purpose I'm supposed to have. And it's in those moments where it's just like, there's that kind of like, ugh, like, (laughs) yeah, this is where I get to do it and walk the talk. Um, I'm going to point out a specific one with an employee this time. It was our first Christmas as a business. Um, and we had just hired this new girl. I was just putting her through my brand new, newly vamped up, renovated system of employee <sighs> processing. <laughs> and I was stoked and I just got her through the whole thing. Wait, so really quick, before you say, I'm curious because the other day I was in the juice bar and you just hired a new girl. Right. Yeah. So I was in the juice bar oh, no. and you were working, making juice, like serving customers. And she was behind you with like a stack of <laughs> like it was a freaking giant stack of papers. And she was just she was reading stuff off of it to you. <laughs> that is right. So, what's that all about? So that was orientation day for her. And that was the first time that I had to actually like work the bar while conducting an orientation which during orientation, we go over the new employee handbook, which is, I think it's like 30, 40 pages of our systems, our procedures, but mainly our culture. And normally, you know, I sit down with them and we go over it and I explain everything. So with this girl, she shows up that morning. I'm like, hey, so this is the first time that I actually really need to work the bar because we're slammed. Well, you know, you're in orientation. Would it be terribly awkward for you if you read it out loud to me while I'm working (laughs) She was yeah. such a good she was such a good sport. She's like, sure. And so she's following me around the juice bar. And keep in mind we've got customers, coming, customers coming in coming and out, and people in the drive thru. It was great. Um I think it was great because our customers were just like eavesdropping and like laughing uh-huh. in the corner. <laughs> So she's like reciting this to me and I'm on and off like, okay, pause. So when I say that, here's the why behind that. This is why we have this system. So that's what was you going on. You know, if you don't, don't ever make it in juice, I'm sure you could just travel around coaching different businesses on how to create oh, tr- training that. manuals and stuff. I love systems, guys. And just to point out for people listening, the importance of systems. I don't think I talk about that enough on the show but at least in our family, systems kind of run in our blood and it comes from <laughs> yeah. our dad really. And any, if you're uh, familiar with the book, e- uh, The E-Myth, um, and any business owner who's been doing it long enough realizes that systems are the key to to success really in business mm-hmm. and to scalability. Yeah. Um, when you've got a system, 
from everything as big as like hiring employees to as small as like how to handle a knife in, in the case of the juice bar. It's it's something where if it's always done this way, you always get the consistent same outcome results. and consistent results. And it's documented so people who leave and new people that come in can pick up right where they left off. And it's just a phenomenal thing. Maybe we'll get into that more, but... Yeah. But that that's what you were doing. So now that I feel like you, you Yeah, and don't <laughs> don't let the word system scare you. It literally is just a step by step like bullet points of how to do something. Like for yeah. the juice bar, um, you know, a closing system is a s- literally step by step to where mm-hmm. I could hand it to someone like a 2-year-old and they could figure it out like, okay, so shut this light off on the open sign and then go over and wash the juicer. And that way you get specific results. And it really helps you have your business be self-running instead of you running your business. Yeah. It's kind of like a check a checklist kind of yeah. concept. And there's a book out there. There's several called- ways to do it, but it's not scary. It just it's time consuming up front, but it will save you time in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's a book out out there uh, that I was saying is called The Checklist Manifesto, which is one of the top recommended books in the in Tools of Titans, which Tim Ferriss's new book, which is like the Bible. Um, I put a link to that in the show notes too, but it's kind of along that that same concept. Um, and it can just, everything from employee safety, making sure knives don't get dropped on toes, which has happened a couple times in the, in the yep. bar I know, yep. to consistency in the drinks. Uh, there's a system for making all of our drinks, so they're consistent for the customers. And so can't stress the importance of that enough. Um, but so your story, let's go back. You, you were telling the story of your worst entrepreneurial moment. Right. Massive Christmas. bunny trail there. So... Anyway, it was Christmas. Bunny trail. <laughs> what is it? Rabbit trail. Same. I mean, <laughs> I like bunny trail better. Same. From me. now on, bunny, bunny trail. trail it is. <laughs> um. Anyway, so it was Christmas. This Ten- is a bunny trail. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, focus. Okay, so Christmas. Okay, Christmas. snow's falling. Everyone's yes. happy except for Kennedy. Um, <laughs> no, Kennedy was happy, but she was about to go to Costa Rica. Tay was going to be busy running the whole studio because um, Ken and her run that together. And I was in charge of that meant like I was the main one doing the juice bar for like that month. Right. And we had just hired this new girl. She was great. Loved her. The system was just flawless, which is like the best day of my life. <laughs> and then one one day our employee comes up to me and basically says that she has to to quit because of this reason and that reason and I was like, okay, well, let's let's talk about this. So what ended up happening is I, I talked to her and I was basically helping her problem solve, right? She was 18 and, um, you know, very, the references is like checked out on her, but I also learned from this experience to really dig a lot deeper with references <laughs> when hiring. Um, and anyway, she listed all these reasons, and but also said that she really wanted to stay and that she didn't want to leave and all that. And so, of course, I'm like, well, I want you to stay. I'm going to help you problem solve here. So I like listed all these things. And when we left that very informal meeting, I was totally feeling good about it. You know, I talked to Tay and Ken, and I was like, it went great. I think she's going to stay. Because if she left, that meant, like, we had to fill so many shifts, and we were super shorthanded already, and it was the holidays, and people were gone, and it was just literally not an option, okay? And anyway, uh, it was Saturday night. We were decorating our Christmas tree. I'm, like, Bing Crosby was on the radio. I was super stoked. I love Christmas. <laughs> And I get this text, and it was a passive-aggressive, probably to this day, one of the roughest checks I received. And it was basically like, you don't respect my dreams. You really, like, you're trying to keep me against my better judgment, against my better will. And it was just Dang. awful. And at the end of it, it was like, because of this, I will not be coming back. And I expect my my last check in the mail. And I was like, <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> And I put my phone down, and I had a moment, and I was like, oh, no. (laughs) Um, So much for the Christmas spirit. (laughs) Yeah, I was just like, squash that. Um, So, because what this meant, she wasn't coming back. She had several shifts the following week. I was already pulling extra extra weight. And so, in my mind, this is all calculating. I'm just like, okay, so I got to hire someone by this day. We got to fill all these shifts. 
what is going on? What even happened here? Um, it's Christmas. I might not be able to have Christmas. I just jumped to the worst conclusion because then hopefully it'll be better no matter what. Right. Um, so Plan for the worst, hope for the best. Yeah. So that was really hard too because I guess in my first really you know experience where an employee actually felt like I did something that I completely promise you I did not do and I was like okay well you can't let your emotions get into this that's the last thing that needs to happen so what ended up happening is I had to recruit I had to hire and train someone in a week which is insanity um but it has all ended super well because the girl we hired was a godsend literally and she is now been with us over a year and is now our assistant manager and is absolutely phenomenal. Um, But I think that would have to be like my, one of my worst, like most challenging moments just because it was so, so inconvenient. And after so much hard work, like you literally like raise the perfect employee, (laughs) right? And right when she gets out of training, she's just like, see ya on completely wrong terms. Um, yeah. so that's, that's the one I'm going to point out for this. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you learn from that? That was the, the, the first experience where I really realized the power of not letting your emotions be dictated by the, by how good <clears throat> your business is going. And because it was the holidays, right. And, you yeah. know, it would have been so easy to just let myself get down and, There was definitely a moment or two where I was like, what are we going to do? Because we were so short-staffed. But I think a lot of times as as girls running businesses, especially you always hear the horror stories of, oh, my boss is a woman, and you know what that means. Super moody, (laughs) worst boss ever. And I think it was in that moment where I was like, I'm going to totally flip those tables and be an emotionally stable woman boss. <laughs> um, so it was, I think the biggest thing I learned from that is no matter what challenges you face, it's going to work out and approach things face value, look at it from an airplane perspective and don't let who you are, how you're doing as a person be dictated by how your business is doing. Yeah, right, right on. Now, because you're so young and running a business that serves thousands of people in our, our city, are there ever any unique challenges you've experienced because you're a young business owner? Just any quick ones that come to mind? You know, I would say there's more. Adv- I asked this question on, the po- on my podcast, too. Um, I would say there's more advantages than challenges. Interesting. Yeah, because because I am so young and I think I decided to be a young entrepreneur at the right time where like, like people underestimate you. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> I'm gonna prove you wrong. Um but no, there definitely have been the moments where people are like, Oh, so you're you're eighteen and you're running this. That's kinda <laughs> scary. Um but you're serving me a drink of <laughs> God <laughs> knows what <laughs> Yeah. Um Honestly, I think the hardest part is just the the lack of experience, and I don't think that's any that it. Well, no matter what yeah, age you are, that that's kind of goes for anything. But um, yeah, that's for any age. But especially in the first year, the most challenging part for me was just learning how to to love change. And I still can't honestly say I love change to this day because I love to have all my decks in a row and that doesn't happen because change equals growth. And when you have things changing, it means you're going to have to fix a lot of things along the way. So experience wise, um, every, every experience we had in the juice bar for about the first year was the first experience we had. So it constantly right. <laughs> felt like I was just never having anything together. Um, so that would probably be one of the hardest things in the first year that I had to experience. What do you, what do you think as, as a young entrepreneur, uh, somebody who's listening who may want to start a business and hasn't yet, where do you think is a good place to start? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you start a business? How do you come up with an idea and, and validate it figure out if it's a good one or not to good enough to run with at least Hmm. that's a that's a loaded question I would honestly take it back to to your life purpose like your ultimate goal your ultimate why for yourself and then work backwards from that 
Um, you know, like my, my life purpose, why I exist on this earth is to inspire and empower the younger generation to live in extreme freedom and complete life balance through the platform of being an entrepreneur and a Christ follower. And, you know, I started a juice bar and you're like, well, what the, how does that work? But the juice bar gave me a platform to start the podcast, which as you can see is more of a direct way to accomplish my ultimate life purpose. Right. So I think that one of the most important things is to divine, you know, what is your, your passion? What is your purpose? And what is something that only you can offer the world and then work backwards, like literally write down on a piece of paper, you know, what does that mean for you? Does it mean you're going to live in a mountain cabin? Does it mean, and how do you get there? And, you know, work backwards from that. And then it's, it's an, What's the saying about the elephant? How do you eat an elephant? Who eats an elephant, by the way? How do you one, eat an elephant? <laughs> yeah, one bite, one bite at, at a time. time. But yeah, if I had to pinpoint something, that would be that would be what it would be. So start starting something from your ultimate why or your ultimate purpose. Yeah, because as an entrepreneur, like you, unless you're like a miracle case or something you're not going to be getting paid for a pretty like a very long time they all say you know do something that you love enough to never get paid well that's really true (laughs) or if you are getting paid you probably will have to keep reinvesting it right for for growth (laughs) right so you don't want to be stuck doing something um that you're not passionate about like i think it's the stupidest idea ever to start something just to make money because money comes and goes faster than (laughs) <laughs> right. seems possible sometimes but your why won't your why will keep you going no, I, I mean I can definitely test to that there's one or two businesses I've started just for the purpose of I think this would be a good way to make some some good money and it's never it's definitely never ended well it's always been the businesses <laughs> that have started from a place of you know giving like this or this is a problem I'm solving or this is what I want to just provide this value yeah. I want to provide and then people are, are asking you know like make a business out of this or, you know, give me something that I can buy. Um, but speaking of purpose, do you, do you think that everybody has a, like one ultimate whole life purpose Hmm. or no? That is a very good question. And I ask that because you, you obviously feel that way and you spout it off yours pretty, you know, you've got, you've got it memorized and everything. You recite it every morning. I am not the I am not the same way, and I've met people like you. I've met people like me, and so I wonder what the what the balance is there. I know James Altucher talks about life purpose, and his opinion is that nobody has a, a ultimate life purpose, hmm, and you're just causing yourself unneeded stress trying to trying to figure that out when you should just be doing something, taking action for for maybe a a purpose that you have f- for that season or for a couple of years, but. I don't know. Have you ever encountered that on on your show, or you know, I I have. But what I've found is that everyone at least has a why that makes them passionate about what they're doing. Right. Um. So I'm not here to say that my what I just said about how to how to start the right business for you is going to work for everyone. It worked for me. Um. But at the same time, not necessarily directly. At the time of starting the juice bar, my my mission statement, my purpose statement that I call it, um, was actually more health driven. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, that perfectly fits. And then it kind of shifted during the juice bar to being more entrepreneurship driven. So I think that, you know, when you start, when you're doing something, if you're running a painting company like you did or a juice bar like I did, like the why behind it should be strong. And I think that can be strong for everyone. Right. Um, like my why behind the juice bar, I make all the employees memorize to inspire and infuse new health, new energy, and a new you into the people of whatever city we're yeah, in. Totally. Like that's a strong why. So I think everyone can find the why and make that passion drive them. Mm-hmm. But as far as somebody having an overall umbrella life passion, I don't think that's necessary for success. But I do think it's important to to have ultimate objective goals, right? Right. Um, to have something that gets you excited and gets you out of bed in the morning. And for me, the best way is to hash out an overall life purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, I just, I get, I talk to people sometimes and myself personally, I've gotten so hung up sometimes on, 
oh, like I haven't discovered my life, my life purpose yet. I'm not you living know, life. And, <laughs> and yeah, you've got this mindset of like, I just have one overarching grand purpose, you know, for being on this earth, or I have to find this one passion that I pursue for the rest of my life. And I, I just, I don't know if that's the case. I think, I think life, like everything just happens in, in seasons and periods of time. Hmm. But like, but like you said, for whatever season you're in, you've got to find your why for that season, right. what you're yeah. passionate about and, and your, um, your purpose for that season and do everything out of that, which brings me to the subject of, of passion because I've also heard, you know, people say, well, pursue your passion. And then there's some people that are like, passion is crap. Don't pursue your passion. I mean, what if your passion is basketball, but you're four foot eight or, or something like that? You know, you can't, maybe you just won't ever qualify to be a pro- professional basketball player, but you're passionate about basketball. So does that mean you should pursue being a professional basketball player? <laughs> <laughs> you know huh. what I mean? Yeah. Man, we're getting deep here. <laughs> My brain's just like, ah. Um, I just, you know, I think you got to find, this sounds super cliche, you have to find. Well, I guess maybe here's the question. Do you think that passion should come before action? Hmm. Because that's what I feel people get hung up on. They're like, oh, man, I haven't found the thing I'm passionate about. So I, I'm not, I don't feel inspired to take action on anything. So they just sit. Hmm. Waiting for their passion to... I think sometimes you actually have to take action for the passion to come. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I'd agree. I think if there's one thing I've discovered most over the last couple of years, it's that if you just sit around waiting for waiting to be passionate about something, find something you're passionate in, enough to be inspired and pursue it and take action, I don't know if that happens as often as as we'd like it to. Hmm. I think a lot of times you just have to start doing something. Do something. Don't just sit there. Do something. And and that passion comes, you know? Like yeah. I've talked to people, maybe you've talked to people who have started out, maybe started in a certain business or a certain job that they didn't get into because they're passionate about it, but now they're passionate about it. Hmm. I don't know. Just, just – uh, now you guys leave a comment below and let us know <laughs> your opinion on it. <laughs> Just some, something to think about or, or uh, mull over there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, Shalane, why don't you uh, – we're, we're getting close on time here. So what, what parting piece of advice would you have for any of our listeners who are thinking of dropping out of school to – pursue a business or an idea or project or a dream job, but they haven't quite made that step yet. Hmm. I would say find out your true motive. And if it is entrepreneurship, then don't let the fear of failing stop you from trying it all because you're one step closer, at least one step closer to success if you at least try and view failure as a learning experience and not as something that is a negative. If anything, it's it's more of a positive. Um, and then, yeah. you know, on the journey, enjoy the journey and make sure that you are being self-aware and growing yourself, taking that time for personal development and taking ownership of, of your decisions, of who you are, of the places that you lead and have influence over. Did you read the questions ahead of, ahead of time? <laughs> I've listened to your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you just answered the second question. Was it advice for people who are already on that journey? But oh, that's awesome. Um, Don't know how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Shalan Ginger on pretty much every single platform, um, Facebook, Twitter. That's with two N's. Yeah, C-H-E-L-A-N-N. You can also check out the entrepreneurbefore25.com website to listen to my podcast and also the podcast with yours truly, Kylan Ginger, that's going to be coming out here in the next few weeks. 
Do people have your permission to email you and yeah. ask you questions? I would stuff? love to hear from you guys. You can email me at shalan at entrepreneurbefore25.com, and I, I love answering any questions that I can. Yeah, I would take her up on that, guys, because here's a, a super, super young gal, uh, no no four-year degree, who's <laughs> learning everything through trial and error and by doing, and honestly, I think, I mean, I've met I know a lot of older business owners, and and you already know more than than some people who are in their thirties and and forties, and maybe just. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. That means a lot. <laughs> starting this, starting this Sometimes business because it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, because you you just learn so much by you know experience. learning learning from doing and, yeah. and experience. I bet you learned infinitely more than than you would have. Oh, staying in college. it's insane. Sometimes I think about it and it's just like, I, I can't imagine where I'd actually be today if I had just decided to enroll in college. I'm not, you know, downing on that at all. If you're in college <laughs> for something that you're passionate about. But for me, I would literally be a different person and I would have, the opportunity cost would have been huge. I would have missed out on impacting, you know, thousands of mm-hmm. lives if I had just decided to do what was comfortable for me. And the thing is, guys, she, she, maybe Shalan doesn't want to be an entrepreneur in a, in another couple years or something. And maybe she wants to go get a job somewhere. You're, you would get hired amazingly quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> because you've, you've, you've self-credentialed, you've built, built up this experience and something you can actually point to and see, like, I built that. I built all these systems. I hired all these employees. I served all these customers. And and you'd get you'd get hired just just like that. There's there's no substitute for actual experience. Don't just spend four years and thousands of dollars learning theory. You actually have to get out there and and play the game. And there's kind of that alluding to that football analogy again. But mm-hmm. anyways, we could we could go on for a while. But successful dropouts. You've been hanging out with Shalan and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind and succeed. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Shaland into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay, stay hungry, hungry, stay, stay foolish. foolish. Stay with me now. Boom. <laughs>